Right. Yeah. All right. I just uh, I'm very glad you 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 are better off now. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyone else need to be a panelist, or are we good now? No, Dave is good here. So Dave, what we're going to do is that you know, Rose is going to you know open open remarks, and then you know I take over, introduce yourself, and then you take it over. And Rose is going to help us to move the slide. You just see next slide. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. We're good to go then? Yeah. All right then. Then, hello everyone. My name is Rose Simpson. I'm a librarian at the New Haven Free Public Library. And we are here with SCORE to talk about uh, global exports and shipping, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, a little bit about the New Haven Free Public Library. Um, obviously we are in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, I'm from the department called I've Squared, which focuses on creativity and entrepreneurship. So we've got a maker space with uh, equipment for prototyping, uh, making different creative projects like laser cutter, 3D printer, uh, vinyl cutter. Um, we've got software like um, Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. We have classes on how to use all those things. So if you're interested in coming to the library to learn how to use any of those, just contact the library. Uh, we also have regular programs on uh, entrepreneurship um, like these, this program that SCORE is running. Uh, if you're interested in seeing what our programs, what programs we have coming up, go to nhfpl.org and check our, on our events calendar. I uh, think that's good for the quick bio. So would you like to introduce yourselves? Okay, uh, uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, this is John Xu and I am the SBA Kinetic District uh, international trade officer. And uh, today's topic, you know, uh, is it, it, all about uh, export documents and uh, Incoton uh, briefings. And we have the honor to, you know, have our industry expert, uh, you know, as a speaker today, Mr. David Noor. Uh, David is the founder and the president uh, of Shipping Solutions, uh, a software company that develops and sells export documentations and com compliance software targeted at the small and mid-sized US companies that export. David is a frequent speaker on export regulations and compliance issues. And he has published several articles on the topic at the Passages, the International Trade Block. You can find more information at www.shippingsolutions.com backslash blog. Before finding Shipping Solutions, David held several marketing positions, including Director of Corporate Communication for the Minnesota High Tech Company. And he was a speech writer for the former Minnesota governor. He graduated from Hamline University in St. Paul, Minnesota with a BA degree in political science. Okay, hi Dave. Hello. Cross yours, mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, should I just dive right in? Are we ready to go? Are other people gonna introduce themselves? Uh, no, that's, that's you and me, yeah, Brian, he, he, you know, score counselor, he's going to hold. So you are the shiny star now. Uh, okay. did, uh, did uh, Rose, you upload the documentations, slides? Where is he? Would you like me to get the slideshow going? Yeah, please. All right, one moment. While we're waiting for those to come up on the screen, um, I apologize for being a couple minutes late. I was participating in another webinar right before this one on export embargoes and sanctions, which was a very good discussion. Robert Imbriani was our speaker for that webinar. And he, I've been going to a lot of webinars on this topic. Obviously sanctions are uh, in the news a lot right now. And, and I think Bob just gave the best overview explanation of what exactly embargoes and sanctions are. So if you have, um, interest in learning more about those. Uh, we did record that and usually on the Monday after a webinar we will have those up on our website. So if you're interested in in watching that webinar just send me an email. I'll give you my email address in a little bit. I'll be happy to send you a link to that as well in addition to this topic we're going to discuss today. 
Um, but uh, thanks again for inviting me. I, for more than 25 years, I've been focusing on helping companies quickly and accurately create export documents and stay compliant with export regulations. Uh, my presentation today will focus on um, documents most typically required in an export transaction, as well as several others that you may come across. Uh, I'll also provide a brief overview of the Incoterms 2020 rules. Those are the globally accepted international trade terms commonly used to identify when the responsibility and liability for an international trans transaction transfers from the seller to the buyer. So I have a version of this presentation that I call the not so sexy side of exporting. Because when most people think about exporting, they think about all that glamorous side of things, the traveling to interesting places, meeting with interesting people, making big sales and all that sort of stuff. But the hard part of exporting, the not so sexy part, is making sure you fulfill your part of the sales agreement, including, including getting the goods to the final destination on time and in the proper condition. And most importantly for you, making sure you get paid on time. So choosing the proper INCO term, generating ex accurate export documents are the key to making sure that happens. So can you click to the next slide, please? You can skip to the next one. So uh, let's talk about export documents. As you can see, there are many different documents that you may be required to use depending on what you're shipping, how you're shipping it, and where it's going. But in a typical export ex exchange, it all starts when you receive an inquiry for about uh, one or more of your products. That inquiry may include a request for a quotation. Next slide, please. Now, if this inquiry came from a domestic product, you'd probably get a standard quotation form that you would use. But in an international transaction, your quote would typically be provided in the form of a pro forma invoice. That's because your international prospect may need a pro forma invoice to arrange for financing, to open a letter of credit, to apply for the proper import licenses, and to determine what else they need to import your goods and make sure you get paid. As you can see, a pro forma invoice looks a lot like a commercial invoice. And if you do it right, they will be very similar indeed. Next slide, please. A pro forma invoice will specify who is the buyer and seller in this transaction and include a detailed description of the goods, the harmonized system cl classification of those goods, the price and the trade term, which is typically expressed in one of the 11 current INCO terms, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a minute. The payment terms, the delivery details, including how and where the goods will be delivered and how much it will cost. The currency used in the quotation, whether it's US dollars or some other currency. It's very important that you date the pro forma invoice and include an expiration date. There's a lot of volatility in the export process now more than ever. So it's important you minimize your risk by setting a very specific time frame for your quote. Next slide, please. Now there's a couple of things I mentioned that I wanted to take a moment to talk about before I move on. The first was the harmonized system or HS classification of your goods. I'm sure this isn't new information for you, but just as a reminder, the HS codes are defined by the World Customs Organization and used by most countries of the world as the basis for classifying your goods for import and export. It's a six digit code that, you should, that should be the same in the US as it is in your buyer's country and it's what is used by your buyer's customs authority to determine the duty rate for your goods. The HS code defined by the World's Cu World Customs Organization is used to create the 10 digit harmonized tariff schedule of the United States for imports into the US. 
and the 10 digit Schedule B code used for exports out of the US. Keep in mind that HS and HTS codes can and do change. Every five years, the World Customs Organization releases a revised list of the HS codes, which they have done for 2022, and every country must adapt. That doesn't mean that most HTS and Schedule B codes were changed in 2022, but US exporters and importers should make it a habit to review the harmonized tariff schedule each year to see if by chance their product codes need to be updated. Uh, but I'm digressing here. An exporter needs to know their current 10 digit Schedule B code when they or their agent is ready to file through the automated export system. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. All you need to know right now is that a pro forma invoice should include the six digit harmonized system code for your products because that's the number that's gonna be the same in the US as well as in the country of, or of import. All right, next slide, please. So that leads us to Incoterms. As I mentioned, you, you should also include the trade term on your pro forma invoice. For an international transaction, that term of sale is typically expressed as one of the 11 Incoterm rules that define who is responsible for the various steps of the export import process. For domestic US sales, the most common, most companies utilize the trade terms found in the Uniform Commercial Code or the UCC. Most of us are familiar with the de delivery terms like FOB origin or FOB destination, freight collect, or some variation of that. While those terms are frequently used within the United States, they aren't generally recognized by companies outside the US. Instead, most countries utilize the Incoterms 2020 rules published by the International Chamber of Commerce. They are a voluntary, authoritative, globally accepted and adhered to text for determining the responsibilities of buyers and sellers for the delivery of goods for international trade. Incoterms course closely correspond to the UN Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods. Incoterms are known and implemented by all major trading nations. Now for the sake of clarity, US exporters and importers should use those terms as well. Incoterms are not a sales contract, Instead, they are often referenced in a sales contract as a type of shorthand for listing who is responsible for what and when the financial risk for the goods transfers from the seller to the buyer. They don't say anything about the price that's gonna be paid, when payment will be made, or the met method of payment that will be used. Furthermore, Incoterms 2020 rules don't deal with the transfer of ownership of the goods breach of contract or product liability, all those issues need to be considered in the sales contract separately. Also, Incoterms 2020 rules can't override any local laws. Next chart, page please. This Incoterms 2020 rules chart of responsibility and transfer of risk summarizes what functions the seller and the buyer, the exporter and the importer, is responsible, for, is responsible for under each of the terms. At the end of my presentation, I'll provide a link so you can download a free copy of this chart from the Shipping Solutions website. So if we look at this chart, you'll see that the names of the 11 Inco terms are highlighted, highlighted in the light purple boxes near the top of the page. Now, it may be kind of small on here, but you'll see it near the top in light blue or light purple. And it starts with X works on the left-hand side of the page, and it goes to the right till you get to delivered duty paid. Now, above each of those names of the Inco terms are the abbreviation for each term. Those are three letter abbreviations and people often refer to the terms by the abbreviation instead of their full name. So this appears in the green boxes 
And again, from left to right, it starts with EXW for XWorks and ends up with DDP for delivered duty paid. Down the left side of this chart are some of the charges and other fees that are part of a typical export transaction. Now it's not all inclusive, but it's a, a, a summary of, of the types of charges that are going to be, that someone's gonna to have to pay for. So they range from packaging the goods before shipping to loading the goods on the inland transport to the delivery of the goods to the named place or the port of export, all the way down in the bottom lower left-hand corner to import duty, taxes, and security clearance. Now to the right of that list, is in the main body of the chart uh, in a series of yellow and blue boxes that indicates whether the seller or the buyer is responsible for each of those fees. So you can see that that changes as you pick a different inco term, those responsibilities shift from the buyer to the seller. Uh, so if we tie that to the inco terms listed above to see that X works, EXW, assigns the least amount of responsibility to the seller, while delivered duty paid or DDP assigns the least amount of responsibility to the buyer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now look above the blue and yellow boxes to the row of boxes in red. These boxes indicate when the liability for the goods being shipped transfers from the seller to the buyer under each of the INCO terms. In other words, if the goods get damaged during the journey, the INCO term identifies whether the seller or buyer is at risk for that damage and hopefully has obtained insurance to cover the cost of that damage. Again, so for example, under XWorks, the buyer is at risk for the goods as soon as they are made available for pickup in the seller's warehouse. So if there's a fire or some other damage, the buyer would be responsible for the cost of that damage to the goods even before they come into their possession. So it's important to note that the transfer of risk from the seller to the buyer can occur at a point that is different from when the responsibility for paying for various aspects of the journey switches from the seller to the buyer. I'll give you another example. So under the Inco Terms 2020 rule, carriage paid to, or CPT, uh, that's kind of just past the middle section of the chart, uh, again, going from left to right. The seller is responsible for delivering the goods to the point where the goods are going to begin their international journey, at which point risk transfers to the buyer. However, the seller is still responsible for the transportation costs required to, for delivering the goods to the named place of destination, which is always on the buyer's side. So let's say I'm selling you a container of widgets from my warehouse in Minnesota, and you're buying them for your factory in Belgium. We negotiate a sale and we mutually agree to use the INCO terms carriage paid to or CPT. Under CPT, I'm paying to load the widgets in the container, deliver them to the port, get them loaded on the boat or the plane, and then deliver them to a location in Belgium we've agreed upon and identified in our sales contract. But if those widgets get damaged during loading onto the boat or plane or fall overboard during the journey to Belgium, you as the buyer are responsible for the cost of the damage. Now, again, hopefully you've purchased this insurance to cover that possibility. And Inco terms identify for you that since you are assuming those risks, you should be buying insurance to cover those possibilities. So if we settled on CPT as our Inco term, we need to reference that, that in the sales contract and indicate the specific place where I will pay to have the goods delivered. And a good, and again, it's very important to be very specific about where those places are. We should indicate that we are using the INCO terms 2020 rules, or we could use a previous set of rules. These rules get updated about every 10 years, 
And companies are under no obligation to use the latest set of Incoterm rules. So if you wanted to use the 2020-10 rules instead, you could do that as well. But you should make sure to identify that in the um, sales contract. And it's important that we include this information on our pro forma invoice and our commercial invoices as well, so that everyone knows what the terms of the sale are. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So which INCO term should you use? Well, many new exporters like to default to XWorks because it seems like it's the easiest to use. And maybe it's the best option for your company in a particular export transaction. But actually, I'm gonna bet that that's not the case. There are definite downsides to using XWorks, just like there are advantages and disadvantages of using any IncoTerm. So you shouldn't randomly just pick an, uh, a particular IncoTerm just to avoid having to understand them. It's important if you're gonna get involved in international trade, that you understand what Inco terms are and what each of the different Inco terms mean. Now, I, we don't have time to go through each of the Inco terms and list the advantages or disadvantages of each of them. There are numerous webinars and seminars that discuss this topic. Um, the best ones last about a half a day to clearly go through the different uh, INCO terms explain why you might choose one versus another, uh, the advantages of them, the disadvantages of them. Um, and, and I would encourage you, it's worth your time to participate in something like that, but that's not something we have time to do today. But I've listed on this slide, um, or, I'm sorry, can you go to the next slide, please? I guess it's on the next slide. I've given you three possible factors among many why you might choose a uh, particular INCO terms. And of course, this is something that you are negotiating with the buyer of the goods. So you need to come to an agreement upon which term to use that is advantageous both for the seller and the buyer. So what I hope you learn from this very brief discussion of INCO terms today is that you understand how important INCO terms are, how important it is for your company to understand the ramifications of using INCO terms, how you shouldn't just be using the old UCC terms of FOB here and FOB there, how that may cause confusion in an international transaction, and how you should make sure to include INCO terms on your invoices for an international transaction. So we'll go back to the next slide and we'll get back to the uh, export documents and we'll actually pick it up with the commercial invoice. So once you've set your, uh, sent your pro forma invoice to your buyer in the, uh, or your international prospect and received their order, you need to prepare your goods for shipping, including the paperwork that must accompany the goods. Of those documents, the commercial invoice is one of the most important. It includes most of the information of the entire export transaction from start to finish. Now, I often get questions from people who look at this sample commercial invoice and wonder why it looks so different from the invoices their company uses for their domestic orders. Well, keep in mind that the invoices you create from your company's accounting or ERP system are accounting invoices used to get paid. Can you go to the next slide, please? This invoice, on the other hand, is used for export purposes. As I mentioned just a little bit ago, this commercial invoice is going to look a lot like the pro forma invoice you initially sent your customer to serve as a quote, uh, that although now it includes some additional details that you didn't know before. For example, you probably now have an order number or purchase order number or some other customer reference number, and you should include that on the commercial invoice. You may have additional banking and payment information. You should include that as well. And you should make sure to include any relevant insurance information, as well as any other details that will ensure prompt delivery of the goods and full payment from your customer. Next slide, please. Now this commercial invoice also helps you stay compliant with US export regulations. 
If any of the goods in your shipment require an export license or are eligible for an export license exception, you need to include the destination control statement, which you see here on the screen. This statement is intended to ensure that your buyer understands that the goods in this shipment are intended for the country listed on the invoice and they shouldn't be diverted to another country. Although you only need to include this statement on the commercial invoice for those items that are controlled under the Export Administration Regulations or the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, I recommend that you include this statement on all your export invoices. In fact, I know a lot of companies that include this statement on all their invoices, international and domestic. For example, if you order a new laptop from Dell Computers, their invoice will include this statement regardless of where you reside. And what this statement helps protect you against is if your good somehow ends up in Iran, for example, having included the destination control statement on your commercial invoice is another form of proof that your company is doing its due diligence to stay compliant with US import, or excuse me, US export regulations. Next slide, please. Now, some countries may require their own country specific invoices for exports to their countries. Uh, what we're looking at here on this screen is the Canada Customs Invoice, and it's required for imports valued at more than $2,500 Canadian unless the commercial invoice includes all these additional data elements. If your buyer resides in one of the 15 Caribbean community countries, they may, may request that you include a CARICOM invoice in your shipment. Next slide, please. An, ex an export packing list may be more detailed than a packing list or packing slip you provide for your domestic shipments. Your freight forwarder may use the information on the packing list to create the bills of lading for the shipment. A bank may require that a detailed packing list be included in the set of documents you present to get paid under a letter of, letter of credit. And customs officials in the US and in the destination country may use the packing list to identify where certain items are packed that they may want to examine. It's much better that they know which box to open or which pallet to unwrap than require them to open up all your packages for them to find what they're looking for. Next slide, please. Uh, the packing list identifies the items in the shipment by package and includes the net and gross weight and the dimension of the packages in both US Imperial and metric measurements. It identifies any markings that appear on the packages and any special instructions for ensuring safe delivery of the goods to their final destination. Next slide, please. Now, some countries like China and certain Middle Eastern countries require a certificate of origin for your shipments that identify in what country the goods originated. These certificates of origin usually need to be stamped signed and stamped by some semi-official organization like a chamber of commerce or a country's consulate office. This certificate of origin may be required even if you've included the country of origin on your commercial invoice. Now, usually a chamber of commerce will charge you a small fee to stamp and sign your certificates or require you to be a member of the chamber. You'll need to deliver a completed form to the chamber office where they will stamp and sign it. Now, one of the many thing, different things that has uh, happened to our industry during COVID is an accelerated use of an electronic certificate of origin, also known as an ECO. With an ECO, exporters can apply for a chamber, chamberized certificate of origin online and receive the certificate electronically or overnight by courier. Now that was very important when many chamber offices were closed during the height of COVID, but even as they reopen, many companies find the ECO service cheaper and more convenient than schlepping back and forth between their offices and the chamber's offices to get the certificates of origin stamped. Uh, we've actually started offering ECOs through our shipping solution software and our website, and we've seen an amazing growth in the number of companies that are relying on electronic certificates of origin. Next screen, please. 
Another similar type of document is uh, our, our country specific certificates of origin. Now the United States currently has 14 free trade agreements with 20 different countries in which goods are eligible for reduced or zero duty rate when imported into those countries. You'll find a list of those free trade agreements on this slide. Some of the free trade agreements such as the USMCA and CAFTA include more than just one country besides the US. To be eligible for these reduced tariff rates, in most cases, the importer must be able to verify that the goods they are importing qualify under the specific free trade agreement. Now, again, we don't have time to discuss the rules of origin and preference criteria under each of the different free trade agreements, but there are essentially three ways goods become eligible under a free trade agreement. One, they are fully, they are wholly grown or produced in the US, like greenhouse and nursery plants grown in Connecticut or hogs raised in Minnesota. Two, the goods are set substantially transformed. Or three, the value of the non-originating parts in a good is less than a specific percentage of the total value of the goods. Now that's a very simple explanation of how goods qualify under a free trade agreement, uh, but I hope you get the point. You can't say that a good qualifies simply because it comes from the US. The rules are more complicated and the importer must be able to prove their claim. Now, how do they prove their claim? They must rely on the exporter or the producer of the goods that the goods do in fact qualify. In most cases, the exporter does not have to complete a specific form to make a claim. A printed or electronic document on company letterhead that includes all the, required, all the required information will suffice. But that being said, um, most companies I talk with are looking for some kind of a template or a model form uh, that looks very similar to this USMCA sample that I've got on the slide um, to ensure that they've included all the required information and to make it easier for everyone, the importer, their broker, customs, to recognize that they are making a claim under the appropriate free trade agreement. Next slide, please. So for example, this is a USMCA certificate of origin. The United States, Mexico, Canada agreement replaced NAFTA on July 1st, 2020. So it's now been in effect for nearly two years and it's fully implemented. We don't have time to de dive deep into the USMCA, but the most important point I'd like to make, and this counts for all the free trade agreement certificates of origin, is that exporters shouldn't sign the form unless they know it's accurate. We get calls all the time from exporters who wanna know what they should put down for the preference criteria so that they can sign and return a form that the importer tells them that they need to provide. They've got no idea if their goods actually qualify and they certainly don't have any documentation to back that up. A company can face significant penalties if they get audited and can't prove that their goods do in fact qualify. That means they need to keep the information they use to make that determination. If you can't prove it, don't use it. There's a case from several years ago now where Ford Motor Company faced millions of dollars of fines because although they knew that their products or their parts for their cars qualified under the old NAFTA agreement, they had no documentation to prove that that was true. So not only must they, you know that they qualify, you need to be able to prove that they do. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, sometimes called a certificate for export or certificate to foreign governments, a certificate of free sale is evidence that goods such as food items, cosmetics, biologics, or medical devices are legally sold and distributed in the open market, freely without restriction and approved by the regulatory authorities of the United States. For manufacturers and exporters of pharmaceuticals and sometimes food products, the customs authority in the country of import may require a certificate of free sale from the US Food and Drug Administration. 
For other types of products, they will accept a certificate of free sale issued by a chamber of commerce. You should check with the importer of the goods if they require an FDA issued certificate of uh, issued certificate. Otherwise you can use a chamber issued certificate because that's usually faster and cheaper to obtain. Now, unlike a certificate of origin, you don't need to provide a certificate of free sale for every shipment. Instead, you may need to provide a certificate of free sale when you first try to import your product into a specific country. You're essentially informing the customs authority in that country, this is a new thing I'm gonna start importing, and here are my support documents that confirm that this product or products are legal to sell in the country of manufacture. To obtain a certificate of free sale, you need to supply a declaration from the manufacturer on company letterhead that the goods are manufactured in the United States. You must also submit copies of at least two invoices issued by your company within the past 12 months showing that you've sold these products to two different US customers. Again, that's something that uh, Shipping Solutions <coughs> can help you with if you don't need a certificate of resale from the FDA. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the most important partners in an export will, uh, that an exporter will work with is their freight forwarder. A forwarder usually arranges the transport of goods with a carrier and help ins helps ensure that you've taken care of everything that needs to be done for this process to go smoothly. Depending on the term of the sale you agreed upon with your buyer, remember that's typically the INCO term that you chose, the freight forwarder may be hired and working for the exporter, or in the case of a rotted export transaction, be hired and working for the buyer. Regardless of who you've hired as the forwarder, or who hired the forwarder, it's important that you provide them with the information they need to successfully move your goods. The shipper's letter of instruction, uh, commonly abbreviated as SLI, is the document usually used to facilitate that communication. Next slide, please. I often describe the SLI as a sort of cover memo that is included with all your other paperwork uh, to tell the forwarder what, you, what they need to know about your shipment. Depending on whether or not the forwarder works for you, the SLI may also include a limited power of attorney, giving them authority to act on your behalf for the shipment. In addition, depending on who hired the forwarder, the SLI may also grant them permission to file the export information electronically, electronically through the automated export system. That's also known as AES. Most exports valued at more than $2,500 per item except for shipments to Canada, must be submitted to customs via AES. Now that's a very broad explanation of the AES filing requ requirements, but the point I wanna make here is that filing through AES is an important consideration for many exporters. If the freight forwarder is hired by the buyer, then it's typically the forwarder acting as an agent for the buyer who typically does the AES filing. Even if you as the seller is the one who hires the forwarder, you may pay them to do the AES filing on your behalf. In either case, even if you aren't doing the AES filing yourself, you are legally required to provide certain data elements to the forwarder so the filing can be done. And the SLI is the document you use to do that. As an aside, now I strongly believe that an exporter should almost always be the party that does the AES filing even in a routed export transaction where the buyer picks the forwarder, you can negotiate with the buyer to give you permission to do so. Filing through AES is not hard to do and it gives you more control over the process. Uh, more and more of our clients are assuming responsibility for doing the uh, AES filing themselves. However, I do understand that many companies would prefer to rely on a freight forwarder for, to do their AES filings. And so to, they need to make sure they have an accurate SLI to make sure that it's done um, correctly. Next slide, please. 
So uh, at this point, we've talked about the six most common export forms that an exporter will produce, the pro forma invoice, the commercial invoice, packing list, certificates of origin, certificate of free sale, and shipper's letter of instruction. But remember, that's just typical. There may be other documents you need, depending on what, where, and how you're exporting, and how much or how little of the responsibility you want to take on. Next slide, please. <clears throat> An inland bill of lading is often the first transportation document that's created for an export. It can be prepared by the inland carrier or you can create it yourself. It's a contract of carriage between the shipper of the goods that states where the goods are going. It also serves as your receipt that the goods have been picked up. In an international shipment, the inland bill of lading is not typically consigned to the buyer. Instead, it is consigned to the carrier who will move the goods internationally, or if not directly to the carrier, to a forwarder, warehouse, or some other third party who will consign your goods to the carrier when ready. Next document, please. First slide, please. If the goods are shipped by ocean or shipping by ocean vessel, you'll need an ocean bill of lading. An ocean bill of lading can serve as both a contract of carriage and a document of title for the cargo. A straight bill of lading is consigned to a specific consignee and is not negotiable. The consignee can take possession of the goods by presenting a signed original bill of lading to the carrier. A negotiable bill of lading is consigned to order or to order of shipper and is signed on the back by the shipper and sent to the bank in the buyer's country. The bank holds on to the original bill of lading until the requirements of a documentary collection or a letter of credit have been satisfied. Now, um, Minnesota-based Cargill used to be a client of mine, and they explained to me how frequently a single shipment of soybeans or some other commodity can be bought and sold during its journey across the ocean. A negotiable bill of lading helps them do that. Next slide, please. If your goods are being shipped on a plane, then an airway bill is required. Unlike an ocean bill of lading, an airway bill can never be negotiable. Instead, it's a contract of carriage between the shipper and the carrier. Next slide, please. If your products are considered dangerous goods by either the International Air Transport Association, or IATA, or the International Maritime Organization, IMO, you need to include the appropriate dangerous goods forms with your shipment. Now, shipping dangerous goods or hazardous materials can be tricky. And before you do it, the appropriate people at your company need to be trained in the proper packaging, labeling, and documentation of the shipment. The document you see on the screen with the red border is the IATA form, the shipper's declaration for dangerous goods, and it's required for air shipments. Now, there's a different version of the form You'll often see it with blue borders, although those aren't a legal requirement. Uh, those blue borders are for ocean shipment. Again, this form needs to be completed by someone who has been specially trained for dangerous goods shipping. Next slide, please. Uh, just during my discussion of the negotiable ocean bill of lading, I mentioned documentary collections and letters of credit. What you see here is a bank draft that may be used to collect payment for exports under those terms. Now, I'm not an expert on trade finance, but I do know that many of our clients use this bank draft in order to collect payment for their exports. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I've tried to give you a basic understanding of the typical documents you need to create for your export shipments. I often get asked by exporters, particularly new exporters or those companies that are looking to expand their exports to new markets, how they know what documents they need to produce. And the answer is simple. They should ask. If you're going to get this right, if you're gonna make sure your goods clear customs at both borders arrive in a timely manner and you get paid in full, you can't start thinking about paperwork only once your goods are ready to ship. When you are talking to a prospective customer in a foreign country, your discussion should include what export forms are required and who's going to prepare them. 
If you don't understand what they're looking for, ask. If what they're looking for doesn't make sense, push back until you are satisfied. You should also talk with your freight forwarder and your bank to find out what documents they think you'll need for your shipment. Your forwarder and your banker are your partners in this enterprise, and they should be forthcoming with advice and assistance. If they're not helpful, find someone else to work with. And once you've determined what documents you need, make sure you fill them out completely and accurately. It's important that your information is consistent across all your documents. A wrong address on a form could slow a shipment. A discrepancy in how you describe a product may cause problems at the bank. And I shouldn't have to say this, but accuracy includes honesty. I've heard too many examples of companies that have changed the SHS classification of their goods on their paperwork at the request of the buyer who is trying to reduce the amount of duty that they must pay upon import. Or the buyer will ask the exporter to lower the price of the goods on the export invoice or mark the shipment as a sample with no value to save them money. Now these may, requests may sound harmless, but they are fraud and they can get the export company and the person who signed the fraudulent documents in a lot of trouble. Not only could you be fined for these activities, in extreme cases, you could lose your export privileges and even end up in jail. Now, the last thing I wanna to touch on in this discussion of export documents is document retention. The various export regulations, and there are several different set of regulations that impact exporting, require that in most cases, you must keep copy of all your export paperwork for at least five years. And when I say export paperwork, I'm not just talking about the export forms you include with your shipment and that I've discussed today. You must also save any correspondence, emails, notes from a phone call, et cetera, that were part of your export transaction. In addition, in addition, you should be keeping track of all the steps you've taken to do your due diligence to comply with export regulations, including denied party screening, export license determination, and review of any potential red flags that you might have uncovered in the process. So you need to document all that. And if you can document that you're doing that, um, if you were to get in trouble, or that you may be investigated for possibly doing something wrong, uh, it's a strong mitigating factor against pen penalties if you can demonstrate you're doing your due diligence. Now this uh, presentation is based on three resources that are made available on the Shipping Solutions website. Uh, the first one is the uh, Beginner's Guide to Export Forms. Uh, it's a detailed white paper that goes even into more detail than I have included in the presentations and discusses each of the documents. It also has the advantage, added advantage, it includes links so that you can download free copies of those different documents in a PDF format. So that's the uh, beginner's guide to export forms and the, there's a link on this slide. The second uh, resources are Incoterms 2020 Rules, Chart of Responsibility, and Transfer of Risk that I showed you earlier in the presentation. Uh, you can download that for free, print it out. It's great to have as a general quick reference. Uh, keep it on your desktop as you're working on your expect, export transactions. Make sure you understand what you're responsible for under each of the different Incoterms rules. And the third, again, a more detailed explanation of the Inco 20, Incoterms 2020 rules is, an, is another free white paper we make available on our website. Again, the link is listed there. It provides more detailed information about the different Incoterms. So you can get any of those uh, that you want if you're interested for free from our website. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, it looks like the two slides got mixed up. These are just the notes that um, were included that I mentioned um, earlier. Uh, last slide, please. So here's all my contact information, all the different ways that you can reach out to me. Be happy to answer if, if we don't, I know we're gonna take some questions today. 
if we don't have time to answer those questions or if you want a uh, follow-up more information feel free to reach out to me using any of these contact methods uh, you can even write me a letter if you'd like um, i don't remember the last time i actually got a letter in the mail but um, i appreciate your time today i appreciate the invitation to be here and i'm happy to answer any questions that you might have Well, thank you, uh, David. And uh, well, for those who have a question, you may raise your hand or you can type in, uh, send in the chat box. Would you like me to stop sharing the screen then? Yeah, you probably. Okay. Any questions coming? No. Oh, Bura, you have any questions, Bura? If anyone's watching on Facebook as well, I'm keeping an eye on the comments there, so you can post uh, questions there as well. Okay, um, we have a question here. Um, it says in an excellent presentation, thank you very much. Are you able to describe some of the EXW downfalls? Absolutely. Uh, and we've got an article on our blog that goes into this in more details. But one of the biggest um, issues with using XWorks as the Inco term is that you are giving up control of your goods at your warehouse door. So as soon as the buyer comes and picks up the goods, they are in control of where the goods go, the export process, and what country they may end up in. Um, this article that I alluded to talks about um, the case of where a manufacturer of items had negotiated with a foreign buyer or foreign distributor to, to buy the goods under the Incoterm X Works. The buyer picked up the goods and then sold them on within the U.S. And because they had negotiated a purchase price that was lower than what the manufacturer sold the goods to their distributors in the US. They were under able to undercut the price of the goods um, in the US. And so what had happened is that the manufacturer actually went and rebought those goods to get them off the market so that they wouldn't compete with their uh, established domestic uh, distribution channel. So that's one disadvantage. The other disadvantage is you um, are still liable for export control. So if you're selling the goods, you know they're gonna be exported. You have to make sure that the goods aren't going to violate the export administration regulations, the uh, US munitions or the international traffic and arms regulations, ITAR regulations, the foreign trade regulations. And by giving up control of the goods so early in the process, uh, there increased chance that the goods may end up in the hands of someone who you did not intend them to have or in a country uh, in which you did not intend and which you should not be doing business. So those are two examples of where XWorks can get you in trouble. The Inco term FCA um, may be a term you wanna examine instead of using the term XWorks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions, Rose, on your side? Nope, I see nothing on Facebook. Okay. What is the penalty, you know, if, if I fail to file required export documents? Well, I mean, it can it can vary. Um, the the most significant one it probably would be the violation of the foreign trade regulations to submit the electronic export information or EEI filing through the automated export system or called AES through the uh, ACE portal or the automated commercial environment that's run by Customs and Border Protection. Uh, filing incorrect information <coughs> or failing to file I believe those are um, $100,000 uh, fines, penalties. I think it's actually higher than that based on inflation. 
uh, per violation. So if you're shipping more than one item, um, you could have uh, a penalty like that on each individual line item, not just for the whole shipment. Great. Yeah, I put your contact information in, you know, in case you, know, you have any questions, particularly or uh, specifically, you can contact you know, Mr. David Noor um, through this, you know, the, the presentation. Of course, we're going to email to you or send to you okay. the, the slides and also feel free to contact Ms. David Noor uh, at the, the, the information I just sent through the chat box. Any more questions on your side, Rose? Nope. Okay. You want to call it a day? Huh? Sounds good to me if you, you, if you two are happy. Okay. So uh, thank you for attending um, today's uh, webinar on export documentations and also include terms. We are going to skip one week next week, and the, the last one will be on 29th. We are going to uh, talk about SBA export loan programs and Exim Bank loan programs, and also the STEP grant, State Trade Expansion Program grant on the 29th at 3 p.m. So see you then. Thank you so much. All right, thank you both, and thank you everyone for joining us. And have a nice evening. We'll have it.